Uh, so thank you guys so much for coming. I'm really excited to be here to talk to you about my new book, um, uh, In a Bad State. So when we, you, in law school, we talk a lot about federalism. You've spent many days in your classes talking about federalism, but almost always in what you might call its regulatory character. That is to say, who has the power to set rules of decision and pro regulations on behavior, um, federal government or state governments or what? And this is, we, in, in law school, we almost never talk about what you might call the other face of federalism, which is the, the flow of funds between the federal, state, and local government. Who pays for what? Um, and this is a, a failure. Um, and it's a failure for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that the fiscal side of federalism is shot through with law, and lawyers are main actors in that discussion. But also, it's really important. Um, there's an old joke that says the U.S. federal government is an insurance company with an army. That is to say, it provides old age insurance, and it has an army, there's an army, but it actually doesn't do very much. Um, and if you actually talk to a government official in America, it is almost certainly going to be a state and local official. And if you receive a service that you understand in a kind of tangible way that isn't the mail, um, uh, it is almost certain to be coming, being operated by a state and local official. Further, uh, the entity that pays for most things that you can touch or smell um, are lo state and local governments. That is to say, almost all infrastructure is directly built by state and local governments and is substantially paid for by state and local governments. State and local governments are really important, and they're really important in their fiscal affairs, and not just like who gets to set rules about, I know, abortion or whatever. This book talks about a particular aspect of state and local finance in a way kind of, kind of brings it, it brings some of the issues about state and local finance into what I hope is our is focus. Um, it talks about what happens when state and local governments go bankrupt. They say, what happens when they can't pay their bills or get close to, go, to get close to default? Um, this is not merely an academic thing. This happened a lot of times in American history. Um, uh, there were a series of state defaults in the, uh, or, or close to state defaults, series of state defaults in the 1840s and, 18, and 1870s. Uh, Arkansas has defaulted on its debts three times. In the book, I jokingly call it the American Argentina um, because it defaults so often. Um, that's a joke you have to be really interested in sovereign debt to get, but you know, whatever, you, know, you can go, go with me here. Um, and uh, it's also not an old worry that um, in, at the beginning of the pandemic, there were substantial worries that uh, a number of state and local governments were going to default. In fact, the head of the Illinois State Senate, the president came to Congress to ask for a federal bailout of Illinois. And this uh, the states did not default during the pandemic, um, uh, largely because of a huge amount of federal money and the fact that the economy never got quite as bad as people thought it was going to. Um, but it highlighted that this is a real concern. What would happen if, what, what should we do if a state and local government gets on the edge of bankruptcy? And one, I was a participant in these debates, both publicly and in advising government. And one of the things that was really notable was how little everyone in the system understood about the problem. Um, there were arguments, people were talking past one another. And so the book is an effort to provide kind of like a handbook to thinking about state and local fiscal crises whenever they come up. Um, uh, some commentator on it joked with me, which is you, uh, state local governments borrow through something called municipal bonds, and you, for a variety of boring technical reasons, you can't short them. You can't bet against them. And a commentator said, David, you've figured out uh, a new financial instrument. You figured out how to short the municipal bonds, short municipal bonds. And he said, because when a municipal bond goes bankrupt, people will buy your book, finally. No. Um, again, there you go. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, I'll be here all night. Try the VL. Um, no. Uh, the question of what to do when there's a crisis is a timely one. It's a one that will kind of will go, and it's been going on for all of American history. To the extent people have written about it, they've written about it in a kind of a single register. They kind of understood the problem as a dilemma. That is to say. You, they understood what the federal government could do if you saw an Illinois or an Arkansas or a New York City uh, on the edge of fiscal crisis as involving two potential choices. One would be um, letting them suffer, uh, austerity. And this was understood to have a real downside, um, which is uh, that it would, um, uh, that it would uh, 
lead to spending cuts during a recession, which is bad for the economy, for key team reasons, and also service cuts. So it's a kind of, by the way, we do this in all recessions. So like one of the things people don't, maybe don't realize is that like, for instance, our spending on homelessness, which is almost exclusively a local responsibility, falls when the economy is bad. We, we cut money into it because governments have to cut. So that's the austerity option. And the other option was understood to be bailout. That's the federal government could just cut state and local governments a check. State and local governments can't print money. They don't have, they can't, they don't borrow in, do, they borrow in dollars. They can't print dollars. And so there's limits on what they can do. They face legal limits on running deficits. So the federal government could just cut them a bunch of checks. And this would have some benefits. This would avoid austerity, but it would have some loss, harms, which uh, particularly when people think of the problem of moral hazard. That is to say, if you keep bailing out state and local governments, uh, they will be less fiscally responsible going forward. In fact, uh, in his kind of classic treatment, the book of which this is a successor, Jonathan Rodden's book, Hamilton's Paradox, kind of says any country that does bailouts of its states ends up taking the states over as a fiscal matter. So almost any country, but they end up, we end up having less, at least less fiscal federalism because the federal government understands that if states are going to, they're going to need to bail them out. They're going to need to take control over their fiscal operations. But there's a problem with this story in an American context. And here's the problem. If you were worried either about doing bailouts or about austerity, you should, in the time before a crisis, be very skeptical of state and local governments borrowing. Um, if you have to do bailout and the government's borrowed a lot, you have to bail them out by more. If you're worried about austerity in a crisis, well, if they have to, debt eats first, and so you'd be worried about that as well. But in America, we've always been extremely pro state and local governments borrowing. It has been a constant political position of the U.S. government that we want state and local governments to borrow. And why is that? It doesn't make any sense given what we said before. Um, and the answer, I, I argue, building on a political science literature, is that the U.S. government just isn't well set up, the federal government, to make investments. Um, from the very first Congress, there were efforts to do big federal infrastructure programs um, at where the federal government would actually be building specific projects. And with a few exceptions, they all kind of floundered. Um, I think many, under, many, some of you in your American history class may have heard about the story of the Cumberland Road, but this is an exception that proves the rule. Um, Instead, when the federal government does infrastructure, it spreads the money out across, uh, famously, lots of lighthouses in the first Congress. They funded a lot of lighthouses. Because why? Because they're in every district. And the structure of American Congress is designed for big spending projects to spread the money out across districts. That is a nature of our districted legislature and, our, and the U.S. Senate. Um, but the federal government still has an interest in infrastructure being built, even if it can't prioritize projects and may not, as, as quickly as the country got bigger, have the informational ability to like figure out whether we need a new dam in Walla Walla, Washington. And so what they do is they subsidize state and local governments borrowing. Um, uh, we have now enshrined this in tax law, which is the interest on money, uh, the interest paid to investors in state and local debt is tax exempt. And the federal government just lo loans money to state and local governments as well. How does this matter for fiscal crises? Well, this interest in state and local governments being able to borrow in order to make investments in all future-oriented things, whether it's roads or schools or whatever, um, exists in a crisis too. And in a crisis, it's actually quite acute. And the state and local government, the federal government's interest with state and local governments is that they want them to be able to continue borrowing in the future. So they want them to be able to borrow in the future. And so their response to uh, potential defaults is to try to often, or sometimes, to make state and local governments pay their debts, even if it means more austerity or more bailout. Um, why? Because that way, state and if the governments pay their debts in a crisis, they're going to be more likely, more able to borrow in the future and achieve the federal government's infrastructural goals. What does this do to a federal government official in a, during a crisis? So if Illinois comes and says, we're going bankrupt, what should we do? The, um, what is the federal government doesn't face a dilemma, but it faces a trilemma. And so what does that mean? It has three options and all of them are bad. It can do a bailout and that would avoid austerity or harm to the municipal bond market, but it would create moral hazard. It could encourage austerity, which, which would avoid harm to the municipal bond market and avoid moral hazard, but it would create economic crisis. Or it could push default as an option, either encourage or help overcome sovereign immunity. And if it does that, it avoids present economic harm and it avoids moral hazard, but it uh, creates 
uh, difficulty borrowing in the future. And if you look through American history and the variety of fiscal crises that, again, go from the very first Congress to the pandemic, we've tried all of these different options, and they've all had the, both the benefits and costs that you might imagine. So um, some of you, many of you, might know the um, probably the most famous of these stories, which uh, is the Alexander Hamilton's plan to assume state debts. You know, I, I'm not going to I'm not going to do cabinet battle number one and start rapping here. Um, I feel like that would be embarrassing. Um, yeah, that would be embarrassing. Um, but um, the the story simply was that the federal government, state, state and local governments, have, state governments had a lot of debt after the revolution, and uh, Hamilton proposed a bailout. He proposed to assume their debts. Um, uh, and this had a very big effect on the ability of state and local governments to borrow going forward. So they said they were much more able to borrow. It had an economically stimulative effect, but it also created moral hazard. And one kind of theme that we're on this is that moral hazard, we often think it happened at the level of like a governor thinking that I'm going to get a bailout. But most likely it operates through the bond markets themselves. That is to say, they get loaned money whether they're a good, interest, a good investment or not. And so, in fact, what we actually saw was that people assumed the federal government would keep standing behind state and local debts. And in fact, a great story, um, Nicholas Biddle, right after the end of the Second Bank of the United States, is now the head of the Bank of Pennsylvania, the U.S. Bank of Pennsylvania, and he goes to England and says, buy Pennsylvania bonds. I'm selling them. I'm the agent for them. Um, don't worry. The U.S. government stands behind them. And he does this in 1830, the late 1830s, and in 1840, Pennsylvania defaults. Um, uh, and the question was, are we going to keep with this bailout policy? And we faced a new choice, and the federal government chose something different. And it chose to allow default. So eight states and a territory default creates very big dislocations. Um, and, uh, and this has the benefits. It reduces moral hazard. States pass balanced budget and debt limits, balanced budget requirements and debt limits, and they're kind of the beginnings of a fiscal constitution. But it has substantial cost, which is that no one will lend money to state governments for a while. So it turns out that from roughly 1840 to the rise of the automobile, state governments are very small players in building infrastructure, and all the action flows to local governments. I'm not going to go through the whole history, but I'm going to get to one point in the 1870s, and then I'll kind of skip ahead a little bit. Um, local governments start investing in railroads, and they invest a huge amount of money in railroads, just a giant amount of money in railroads. Um, uh, it's, it's kind of railroads are going around the country asking for subsidies from local government. It's like the monorail episode of The Simpsons. They're like going in and, and, offering, um, and offering, asking for subsidies from different cities. And uh, this leads to a set of crises. It leads to huge benefits, which is that we get a railroad system. Um, this is 10% of the US economy. It's a really big deal. And state and local governments start uh, defaulting left and right. And the question again comes, what should the federal government do? In roughly the same period, this is a series of defaults from the 1860s to 1890s, uh, at the end of this period, almost all southern states default. That say after the end of Reconstruction, almost all southern states default on their debts. And again, the, we're faced with a decision about what to do. And in both of these stories, the main actor is not Congress, but is the Supreme Court. And why is that? Well, the federal government just didn't have enough money to do bailouts at the time. State and local governments were much, much bigger than the federal government. Um, and so their ability to do bailouts was a little doing it. So the question was, wh who should lose, taxpayers or, um, or creditors? And we saw divergent outcomes. So the Supreme – in the um, – the doctrine you guys learned in procedure class that we call Swift versus Tyson before Erie is actually almost entirely about the law of municipal debt in practice. And what it was was a series of decisions where the Supreme Court made up a bunch of law, again, for better or for worse, to, in order to um, protect municipal bondholders against states that wanted to default. Um, and this led to huge crises across all of the West of the United States who had d jurisdictions defaulting left and right. Um, cause, uh, uh, and cause, uh, they were forced to dig deep and pay taxes in order to pay their debts. Um, but it caused, you know, they, towns would fire their whole police departments during the middle of crime waves and caused huge economic contraction. But it had the benefits of forcing governments to pay their debts, which were that they, governments were continued able to borrow. And so in the period 
after these crises, we see the great period of American infrastructural development. So the Brooklyn Bridge or the, you know, the aqueducts and that you see in Baltimore and Chicago. There's a, a line from the historian John Tiford which said the, um, the, the government of Chicago declared that the building shall be raised and they were raised. It declared that the river shall be reversed and it was reversed. The acts of the city government of Chicago were like that of the Old Testament God. Um, and why were they able to do this? Well, they were able to borrow huge amounts of money because they were confident that they would get people would get paid back. Move to the southern states who defaulted in the 1880s and 1890s. As part of the end of Reconstruction, the federal government said, we are not going to force you to pay your debts. And how did they do that? They made up sovereign immunity law. So again, the, one thing about Fed courts, for those of you who are uh, enjoying uh, your Fed courts experience, is that one way to teach a Fed courts class is that it's actually the law of municipal debt. Because almost all of the important doctrines of Fed courts were created in the context of, or not all of them, but many of them, in the context of this. And so the doctrines of cases like Hans versus Louisiana and the cases that lead up to it were all about protecting southern states against their creditors. Um, uh, and this had real benefits. The southern states were in economic uh, default, and the fact that they didn't have to pay back their largely eastern creditors gave them an economic fillip. On the other hand, it meant they couldn't borrow for a long time. And so if you ever drive around or you're around the, the American South, you'll note that the, all of the infrastructure feels real new. And it's because of their, it wasn't old, because they didn't build as much during the kind of great period of American infrastructural development. And this had big effects on economic outcomes. I go through the history of the 19th century, not to say that the history ends in the 19th century, but to say, to kind of show the moving pieces of this trilemma. That is to say, you have three choices and all of them are bad. And so if you go through the 20th and 21st century crises, whether it's the New York City fiscal crisis of the 1970s, or what just happened in COVID, or Puerto Rico, or Detroit, or whatever, um, you see the same moving pieces. They get what the answer is changes, but we see the same moving pieces. Um, we're still left with a question, though. What should we do if Illinois comes and says, we can't pay our debts? What should the federal government do? Should it offer a bailout? Should it say, you got to pay your debts? We're not going to offer you any mechanism for avoiding your debts? Or should it say, eh, stiff the creditors? Um, the book doesn't give a single answer to that question because every crisis is going to be different. So there's not one timeless answer to that kind of question. It does, though, suggest that there are a couple of values that we could build into our responses that would help us produce better rather than worse outcomes. And so I will lay a few of those out before I go to questions. Um, the first one is it could build prudence into the system. So. Uh, the, um, there's a scene in a very, in a now very old movie, but was a very uh, formative movie, with, with the movie War Games, in which he goes, they, they, or and they say, the, the computer figures out the, uh, that the, uh, the solution to nuclear war is not to have it, which again, seems like a, uh, uh, benign, you have to understand, it goes through the thing of, and it says this line, um, it's a funny game, the only way to win is not to play. And the only way to win a fiscal crisis for the federal government perspective is to have states not have them. And states are the primary actors in, re in reducing their own fiscal crises. And so the first thing the federal government can do in building crisis, in, build in responding to crisis, is encourage governments to be more responsible going forward. And so I argue for a variety of conditional spending programs that say they give money in a crisis or ultimately tie it to other flows of money that encourage states to engage in better fiscal practices, whether this is um, better accounting for their, uh, for their pension systems or uh, uh, kind of um, uh, uh, accrual accounting for their ordinary budgets, and a whole variety of other proposals. A second thing they can do is spread the pain. So anyone in America is governed by many state and local governments. You live in a city, there's a school district, there's a county, there's a state. In Connecticut, we actually have less of this than we do in most other places. You're governed by a whole number. If you're in Illinois or you're in Michigan, you're covered by an almost infinite swath of governments. You have no idea who's governing you in any different way. The Mosquito District, the whatever, a lot of things. Um, um, and uh, one thing we see is that uh, governments have crises at the same time, but there's a lot of conflict between them. They don't want to be the government that, like, actually goes bankrupt. And so when Detroit goes bankrupt, the Detroit school district doesn't, and the Detroit school district gets a bailout from the state government. And this leads to some really weird outcomes. So like, 
police officers' pensions take a hit, but teachers' pensions don't. And by the way, the districts, they're the exact same geography. Um, and so I argue that we should build in tools to our system of municipal bankruptcy. We don't have a system for state bankruptcy, but our system for municipal bankruptcy um, uh, to, uh, to allow multiple governments into bankruptcy. In fact, I argue that we should allow states into bankruptcy as well. This is a proposal that's had a, a number of, of kind of pe people liking it from one point Jeb Bush, David Skeel, but kind of had in, ins and outs in politics. But the idea here is that we could spread the pain across more people. Um, a, a for, another answer would be balancing harms. And that is to say, you don't, while the trilemma is three options, you don't have to pick all of one or all of another. You can offer a little bit of a bailout while also requiring some austerity and maybe some defaults. And again, bankruptcy law has tools for allowing this, which is that so if you take the Detroit bankruptcy and you can see the Puerto Rico uh, quasi-bankruptcy in a similar light, the federal government can make creditors take a hit by creating a legal process for negotiating among creditors, which is what bankruptcy does, and then offer money later, after on the way out rather than on the way in. And this is a, a, a bailout still, but a smaller one that creates less moral hazard, but also um, <coughs> um, uh, allows for harms to creditors. And similarly, it allows for some balancing across harms to creditors and harms to, um, uh, harms to current taxpayers through a judge assessing these. Finally, the government could, we can build in tools that encourage resilience of the system. And so I have some somewhat more technical proposals about the way we could think about the um, interest exemption and argument for the interest exemption on municipal debt. But another one is just letting people move around more, making it easy to move around the country. So one crisis that we problem that we see in fiscal crises is that people want to leave and it's very easy for richer people to leave, but it's a lot harder for poor people to leave because it's hard to move to opportunity in this country. You don't necessarily carry your benefits with you. Housing costs may be higher or whatever. And so we can think about ways to encourage mobility among the full set of population and not just the richer parts of the population in response to crises. But the final kind of resiliency is one we can build ourselves. It doesn't require the federal government to do so, but it, does, it is incumbent upon us. So one of the reasons in the contemporary period we see state and local governments having fiscal crises, and we do, um, is that no one's paying attention to state and local government at all. Um, outside of the one directly elected local official I see in here, how many people know who your alderman is? There you go, that's good, because he's sitting there, that's good. Um, how many people know who your county commissioner is at home, wherever you're not from Connecticut? Got a, got a few people here, here and there. Right. In general, people have no idea who uh, represents them at the state and local level. Um, this is a, uh, a product of a variety of forces, the nationalization of our political parties and the decline of local media. Um, but this has the effect of us not having great checks on state and local fiscal uh, poor performance. That is to say, it is very hard to use even the kind of heuristic tools we do to follow government, like political party, at the state and local level. It's just really hard to know what's happening, and it's very hard for anyone but the kind of, except for intense policy demanders who have a real interest in finding out what's happening, uh, whether it's um, interest groups or, um, or, uh, or in the local level homeowners to um, have a real interest in kind of getting something from government. And this, there's not a lot of mechanisms for mass popular opinion, which would be the tool through which fiscal rectitude would be um, enforced to happen at the state and local level. And this puts it incumbent upon us to come up with ways out of this bad state. That is to say that by focusing more on state and local government and buying great books about state and local government, um, you can, um, we can begin to build a more resilient federal system. Fit. All right, great. Um, so thank you for, uh, well, you know, giving me this chance to uh, talk about the book with you. Um, I read the book across two or three days this week. Uh, it was a fantastic read. And um, the interesting thing was, so yesterday, I, I, I don't know if you guys watched this thing, but you know, yesterday the Chinese president visited the US for the first time in six years. Um, and if you guys haven't noticed, like, you know, Sino-US relations are pretty much at a kind of like a down point these days. And this was an attempt to kind of like, 
slightly make amends and also establish like a baseline so that things don't get don't get too much worse. And so both Biden and Xi were giving these nice conciliatory speeches where they were talking about the need to find uh, commonalities across the two countries and you know, um, find shared experiences and things like that. And then I was like, oh, they should read Schleicher's book. <laughs> Right, because why? Because you know, like having lo bad local government debt and having local governments go bankrupt seems to be like the one common, like the one big common problem that both economies share these days, and they could kind of like reminisce and and um, over each other's sufferings and pain by reading this book and then getting like a like a stiff drink or two, or, or maybe five. Um, so leaving that aside, right? Um, there's a lot of stuff in here that does seem very generally applicable to me, and then there are things. Um, that seem more kind of idiosyncratic to the U.S. And I, I, I want to ask about both elements uh, of, of the analysis, right? So in, in a lot of ways, like the most general theoretical statement in this book is, the, is that what I'm going to call that like the Schleicher impossibility theorem, which is that you can't have all three of these things. You can't have um, infra infrastructure spending. You can't have um, uh, Avoidance of a uh, of a depression and um, and more like avoidance of moral hazard all at the same time. You have to basically at most get two out of three. And I guess I, I kind of want to ask like how generalizable is that theorem, right? Um, like the theorem rests upon I think two basic mechanisms. One is one of which is the the, the simpler, more intuitive one is that yeah, if you give people free money, they're going to be usually be less respons um, responsible for that compared to the money they earn for themselves. And this is true of whether it's people or governments. The second more interesting, kind of like more complicated mechanism is that in the book, you pitch the idea that, um, frankly, allowing local governments to go bankrupt and f imposing the costs on creditors is actually going to have less of a macroeconomic impact than fiscal austerity. Right now, this is very plausible, I think, especially for those of us who are kind of more inclined towards Keynesian economics. Right, but it's also kind of debatable. Given it seems to vary depending on how embedded your local governments are inside your your average financial system. Right, U.S. local governments may not necessarily have that level of embeddedness. Well, you can imagine other other kinds of local governments, especially lots of local governments in Asia, not just China. China is probably the most obvious one, but also you know Japan probably India as well, where local government debt is deeply embedded in the overall kind of like financial and fiscal infrastructure of the entire, of the entire country, and therefore like a, series, a cascading series of local government defaults might actually have like a severe financial shock on, 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 on the country, right? So the first question basically is, you know, is this some kind of like idiosyncratic U.S. story, or is this a more generalizable story? Now, the second question, this is... Let, let me give you both at the same time. Um, the second question really is, all, is, is also about like, you know, like what is unique and what is generalizable here, which is, you know, like frankly, most other regimes, when they bail out their local governments, and you see, you've seen this a little bit in India, but you'll, you'll, you'll also see this very prominently in China these days. Um, they do, the way they deal with the moral hazard problem is by imposing non-fiscal, non non-financial penalties on local government officials, right? Um, Usually, you know, investigations for corruption, investigations for incompetence, career um, career problems, and so, on. so so of course, like a lot of these things aren't plausible in the U.S. context because of your, of your federalism. But some of the tools might not be so utterly unimaginable, right? Like you know, th things like corruption, graft, and so on and so forth uh, have a certain kind of like nationalized system there, right? You could potentially prosecute and investigate local government bureaucrats from the from the federal government center down. Um, for certain kinds of corruption or fraud and so on and so forth. So I, I guess my question is, you know, like, is there, is there like a world in which those things are weaponized a bit more robustly so that they complement your financial incentives to reduce moral, moral hazards? Really good. So there's a lot of questions there. Um, the first one is that the, whether they do it through um, uh, non-financial tools or financial tools, it has one of the effects that uh, it shows up in the international literature, which is that bailouts are usually associated with greater federal control over state and local fiscal affairs. And it can happen through a direct legal mechanism, like they set the budgets in some way, or they remove the ability to tax and then do more money through transfers, or it could happen through these, if you default, you get killed mechanisms, 
or go to jail or whatever. Uh, but the story is the same in some level. And one thing you see across most countries that have state local fiscal crises is that um, uh, in the period afterwards, there becomes almost no spread between state bonds and the federal bonds. Because everyone understands that they are basically the same thing. They say the federal government is standing behind them. And so the, um, you see this in European countries as well as um, uh, the, you get some crises in play countries that can, don't have the, the federal capacity to impose any conditions. So in Argentina and Brazil would be the two classic examples of that. Um, but you could imagine any t a number of types and non now like how that would work in an American context becomes a little less than perfectly clear. But we do see one kind of very prominent one, which is like political punishment, yeah. um, which is you kind of go on the outs with your political party. Although this is actually there actually gets inverted at certain points. So some of you may remember um, the, the the kind of presidential campaign of Dennis Kucinich. So Dennis Kucinich had been mayor of Cleveland when it defaulted, and then he runs again when he runs for Congress. He um, it, he defaulted on a, on an electric on electric company bonds, and the story is a little more complicated. But it's a, he put on his picture a um, a picture of a light bulb to recall the incident in which, Illinois, which Cleveland defaulted, which he said he was standing up for the people against the bankers. And so it's quite difficult to impose those type of context in our much more disaggregated political system. The Broader question of like how generalizable this is, is the book is intentionally domestic. So rather than doing international comparison, which is the way that Hamilton's paradox is, it's a, an, it gets variation from American history. And it's because it's trying to highlight some of the domestic institutions that cause the particular problems. And particularly, the thing that is like most domestic in the story is the story of the way Congress's structure leads the federal government to be a small player in infrastructure vis-a-vis -vis state and local governments. Um, that isn't true in most countries. That is to say, our level of districting and disaggregated political institutions are at least not, if not unique, but are quite different from what you see in most other countries. Um, that said, there are some generalizable lessons. So one of the other reasons the federal government isn't so directly involved in infrastructure is just the informational problem. That is to say, it's just really hard for a bureaucrat in Washington or a congressperson or anyone to know what is needed in New Haven. Like, they could figure it out, but like, they're not here, they're doing other things, you know, it's just informationally difficult. And that's one story that I think does generalize pretty clearly to continent-sized countries, so it makes it a lot like China, although not a lot like some other, England, yeah. right, right. And so, um, the, um, the, the, in that way, the story is consistent rather than inconsistent. Now, the, um, other thing that makes the American, and again, I'm no expert on Chinese local government policy, I need to get a little coached up, but the, um, uh, that the American fiscal system is, the local, state and local fiscal system is really different from the Chinese uh, fiscal system. Uh, it, if anything, the comparisons are much closer to kind of earlier American history where uh, a U.S. governments, U.S. state, probably local governments, made a lot of their revenue from selling property. So think Dick Hurtog on New York in the, the early period, which is actually quite a lot like Chinese local governments in their um, fiscal structure. The kind of rise of property taxation as the major form um, of, uh, of funding for local governments uh, and state governments for most of this period really makes some tensions in the story. Um, um, I don't think there's anything else to add on this this international comparison question. It's um, you know, it's a uh, it's a it's a it's a uh, um, tough question to answer in a lot of ways because uh, it relies. Oh, let me another one thing. One other thing I'll say is that the um, uh, U.S. has worked very hard to make its municipal system uh, separate from the problem of, of, of financial crises. And so people that in 1986, in a provision that people in my world know, but other we basically encouraged banks not to lend money to local governments, that almost all borrowing by local governments is done through individuals, particularly rich individuals. And the reason is that you get a exemption from your federal income taxes on the interest, which makes a lot of sense if you pay income taxes. Um, and particularly if you pay the highest rate of income taxes. And so the interest exemption is actually a pretty inefficient subsidy in a lot of ways to local governments, but it has this huge benefit, which is that it reduces contagion and reduces 
the infinitely that. And like, I think that that is something, rather than it be, that something that other countries could learn something from the American system, which it would have, um, it has some short term uh, inefficiencies associated with it, um, but it has some real gains in terms of stability. So in the book, I argued this is one of the things that like, the interest exemption is inefficient and disliked. In fact, it's been disliked by almost every president um, of all. So Franklin Roosevelt tried to give a speech in the well of Congress about repealing the interest exemption, and Ronald Reagan went after it also, and all in between did as well, and then many and a few since then, including uh, Donald Trump. Um, but it's maintained itself, and I think for good reason, which is right. that it helps avoid exactly this, the Chinese well, problem. So, so I would tend to agree, except for one observation, which is that it's also true that other governments ask the local governments, frankly, to, to do more in terms of spending, infrastructure, investments, economic stim stimulus, and so on and so I mean, forth. So, in the US, oh, though, oh, right. so again, most countries don't. China has an extremely, extremely decentralized well, in some ways. Well, most developing countries do. Right? Yeah, so again, so, again, yeah. That, that's another thing that I kind of track in the book here, which is mm -hmm. that like, the stories from the 19th century actually look quite Chinese in some yeah, ways, yeah, yeah. whereas right. um, the 20th and 21st centuries look a little different. Okay.